Hi, uh, good morning everybody. Uh, I'd like to start by just thanking uh, the organisers, including Jane Bresington, for inviting me to speak to all of you today. Um, my remit is to talk about the diagnosis and mutation analysis of GIST. But before I start, uh, whenever I give a talk about GIST, I start with a little straw poll. Um, and this was prompted by a good colleague of mine asking me at the end of the talk, how exactly should you pronounce the word GIST? So do you pronounce it as an A, GIST, or B, G, because it's gastrointestinal GIST. So if you don't mind a bit of audience participation, just a show of hands, uh, who pronounces it as A, GIST? Okay, and GIST? Okay, so the gist have it, which is just well, because that's the way I pronounce it. <laughs> and I, I, I don't think I could trust myself to change to gist. Uh, um, but I'll be giving this talk again, not, not this talk, a similar talk to some pathologists uh, next month in Edinburgh, and I'll ask them and see what they say. So, um, the diagnosis and mutation analysis of gist, that's what I'm supposed to be talking about. Like I said, I'll be speaking to some pathologists and scientists about this. Uh, a similar sort of subject uh, next month. And I know you guys, uh, as a group, are going to have much more knowledge and interest in this topic than those pathologists and scientists. But even then, having done this sort of talk many, many times before, I know that when I have to talk a lot about laboratory techniques and DNA and molecular genetics, it can be a bit, uh, shall we say, boring. Uh, so, to try to make it a bit more engaging and a bit more, not so much entertaining, but a bit more interesting to you. What I thought I'd do would be to talk about, yes, the diagnosis and mutation analysis of GIST, but let's also talk about how we got there. What's the journey that we took to get to where we are right now? And by journey, I'm going to be talking about how um, GIST came to be diagnosed. And by diagnosis, I mean not the clinical, as in the physician uh, or the radiologic, uh, radiological x-ray diagnosis, the laboratory diagnosis of GIST. So we'll concentrate on laboratory techniques. And I'm going to talk about four techniques in particular. And they are, to start from the top, um, light microscopy. So what does this entail? This is what I do as a histopathologist every day. So it involves taking very, very thin sections of tissue. And we're talking about three to four thousandth of a millimeter thin sections of tissue, so thin that light can pass through the tissue into magnifying lenses, through eyepieces into my eyes, so I can have a good look at what the tissue looks like um, in those sections. And that's called light microscopy, as many of you will know. I'm going to talk less about this microscopy, it's called electron microscopy, A, because I know less about it, uh, and because it's less often used these days. It's, it's a rather data technique for the field of pathology that I'm interested in is the GI tract. It is used in renal pathology so. And certainly with regards to GISTs, we hardly ever use EM, as, as it's called. This I'll talk a bit more about because I know a lot more about this, and we do use it at the current time, uh, and we will probably be using it in the foreseeable future. Immunohistochemistry, or ICC, or IHC. Immunohistochemistry is based on antibodies, which are proteins which specifically target molecules. So if we were to choose, for example, CD117 or CKIT that a lot of you are aware of, let's pretend that was A, you would raise a specific antibody which only binds to that protein and then you tag something onto the back of that antibody which allows you to visualize where that specific antibody has bound. And usually we go for a color brown as shown here. In fact, this is a CD117 antibody which is staying at the gist. And these negative cells, these blue cells, are lymphocytes, which shouldn't be standing up with CD117. Very important technique, as you'll see. And finally, of course, uh, over the last couple of decades, molecular genetics. And there's lots of different molecular genetic tools that we can use. But with regards to GIST, we are particularly interested in what's called sequencing. So, um, just to go through very briefly molecular genetics uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so you know about DNA. DNA is a genetic code. There are four main components to DNA. They're called nucleotides or base pairs, A, T, G, and C. Different colors shown on the left-hand side. We are interested in certain parts of certain genes, which I'll talk about in a second. Those parts are called exons, little parts of genes. 
And we are interested in mutations where the genetic code is changed in some way. So the way that we study or look for those mutations is to amplify lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of that particular exon. And we use a technique called PCR, which you may or may not have heard of, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. And what it does, is, as I said, it amplifies so many copies of the area that we are interested in that we can then slip that through a special machine called a sequencer, and that will give us a readout of the different nucleotides in that amplified bit. And that's what it looks like in real life. That's what I look at. It's called an electrophoretogram or a trace, and the different colors represent different base pairs of nucleotides. So that's so-called Sanger, classic sequencing. OK, we're going to start our journey in 1960 and 1962. And you may or may not remember, for those of you who are alive, the, the top-selling UK single in 1960 was Elvis Presley's It's Now or Never. Not one of my favorite, although I am an Elvis Presley fan. And what I didn't know was in 1962, the top-selling single was this chap. And I've heard somebody say his name already, because I was thinking, who is this guy? And you're absolutely right. I, was gonna, I should have asked you, what single was it? But, there you go. Okay. Where was I during this time? Shall we just say I was a twinkle in my dad's eye. <laughs> but 1968 was an important year because a doctor or professor, Martin or perhaps Matin, as a, as a French man or woman, described with colleagues, I'm not going to translate, but I can just guess, it means muscle tumors within the wall of the stomach. And so he and his colleagues, or she and her, and her colleagues, using only light microscopy, because that was the only of those four techniques available at that time, described these rather strange looking tumors arising mainly in the stomach. And they thought this doesn't look like an adenocarcinoma or a lymphoma or a lymphosarcoma, as it was called then. And particularly looked at these weird round things. And they thought this was probably some sort of smooth muscle tumor. And that's as far as they got. 1962, Arthur Stout, who was an American, was an American pathologist, uh, referred to Martin's paper and carried on the analysis. And in his paper, he describes or shows a list of, what's that, uh, 108 other diagnoses which were offered for these tumors. I'm not going to go through all of them. So really, nobody really knew what they were. And on the left-hand side, there's a picture taken from the paper. And he was particularly interested in these tumors, which had round, so-called epithelioid cells. And so the words that he started using these pathologists at that time in the 60s were lyomyoma, which is a benign tumor of, the smooth, smooth muscle, of smooth muscle, lyomyosarcoma, which is a malignant tissue, uh, smooth muscle neoplasm, and stout coined this term lyomyoblastoma, to describe the, the round-looking um, celled neoplasms. And in his paper, if you look closely and deeply enough, there's a reference to a pediatric case. A woman, uh, sorry, a girl of age 14 uh, was included in past services right up. And interestingly, and the reason why I'm talking about this, hopefully will become clear later on, there was a case where they'd found this tumor in a lymph node from a stomach which had been resected from one of these patients. Like I said, I'll come back to that. So we're going to fast forward a couple of decades to 1983. So you may fondly or not fondly uh, remember that the best-selling single in the UK at that time was Culture Club's Carmen Chameleon. Um, where was I in 1983? I, was, I had been sent to boarding school in Singapore, somewhere in there, in Queenstown. And I should have been uh, really revising for my O-level mocks but I was being a bit distracted by this thing called football. And I was spending a disproportionate amount of time on this very same football pitch, unbeknownst to my fee-paying parents. Uh, anyway, more importantly, 1983, hallmark year, because this is the first year when a publication came out using the term stroma tumor. So this is where we get the word gist or gist from. Mazur and Clark's paper in, uh, in an American journal now, the techniques available now included light microscopy, immunologist chemistry, and this is, it's in black and white, so you can't see um, what it's trying to show, but this is an antibody targeting something called S100, which is a marker of nerve cells. 
And so they found that some of these tumours, these stromal tumours, stained with nerve-like markers, some of them using electron microscopy, EM, showed smooth muscle sort of changes. Um, but a lot of them didn't fit either category. And so, rather prophetically, um, they concluded that they still, or we still needed to refine our knowledge of the histogenesis of gastric stromal tumours, which is, of course, very true. And indeed, we, or the medical pathological fraternity, did. Over the next decade, more EM was performed. Some people suggested there was a special subgroup of GIST called GANT, G-A-N-T, as you can see, gastrointestinal autonomic nerve tumour uh, tumours. And then we had more <coughs> antibodies to, to, when I say play with, to use. Desmin and SMA, again, markers sort of, of smooth muscle tumours. And we were getting, again, some evidence that some of these tumours seem to be smooth muscle, some of them seem to be neural, but a lot of them were neither. 1994. Unfortunately, <laughs> wet, wet, wet uh, dominated the charts in this year, so I, I'm admitting to a bias here. What was I doing? I was, I was on a medical senior house officer rotation in Oxford. And while, again, I was supposed to have been studying for my postgraduate um, physician's exam, I was again being distracted by, um, well, you can see. But in 1994 and the following year, um, there were three publications, all studying a uh, protein called CD34. And uh, these studies were important because, first of all, they showed that at that time, this was the most useful antibody to help diagnose a GIST lift because it was expressed by two-thirds of all GISTs. So that was pretty good for that time. But it also showed that because CD34 is not normally expressed by spew muscle or nerve tumours, it, it helped nail in the final nail in the coffin that these were not just smooth muscle or nerve tumours. These were a specific <coughs> sort of individual tumour. And this is around the time when I entered uh, in, into the field of pathology, uh, around 95, 96. And I was introduced to GIST learning about this sort of classification, which is extremely complex and, and we now know to be misleading. So there were GISTs and they were thought to either show a little bit of myoid, which is muscle type change, or a bit of neural nerve-like change, or a bit of autonomic change, or neither, or nothing at all. And then the more malignant ones were called GISTs, or GISTs, or GISTs, um, with the sarcoma at the end. And again, this complex uh, sub-classification. And things continue that way till around 1998. Come back from Cher. Uh, I think I actually bought this single. Uh, I, I'm so, sort of, when you get older, I guess you don't worry so much about your musical taste. When you're young, you're sort of uh, very conscious about how trendy you are. But anyway, um, where was I? I, I? I was a pathology lecturer in Edinburgh. Um, and again, I should have been studying for my um, pathology exams, but this time I was being distracted by learning about the finer points of single bolts, particularly the third from the left, Talisker, um, to be recommended if anybody's not aware of its existence. So, um, but in 1998, this is truly a, a seminal paper. This was published in Science, and as you know, Science is not just a top, I mean, it's a top scientific paper, not just for medicine, for all sciences. So the fact that this paper was published in Science shows how crucially important it was, and it still is. So Saichi Hirota, and colleagues in Japan described a couple of things. First of all, the fact that GIST express CD117 or CKIT, as many of us refer to it as. And in fact, that's important. It's an immunohistochemical technique. And it's particularly important because compared to CD34, which stains up th about two thirds of GISTs, CD117 stains up almost all GISTs, but maybe about 5%. And the expression of C kits in GISTs became very important to certain governing bodies or certain uh, organizations like NICE when they produced their guidelines on hematin abuse in 2004. And that guideline dictated that your GIST or anyone's GIST had to express C117 in order for it to be treated with hematin. Now, now we know that's slightly misguided and we've changed our practice since. So because of the crucial um, role of C117, Immunist chemistry in, in diagnosing and guiding treatment of GISTs. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of people did research, into, including myself, 
to refine how we actually do the technique and making sure we didn't get false results. But the other crucial finding of Saichi, Hirota and colleagues was the demonstration of KIT. KIT is the gene which encodes for the protein C kit. Mutations in the KIT gene. Now they studied five gists, in fact six gists, and they found KIT mutations, as you can see in the top line, in five out of six. So that's about 83 percent. So what they were uh, uh, happy with was that rarely gists did not express or did not show KIT mutations, and in fact this was borne out by following studies, which found KIT mutations in a variety of proportions, but never 100 percent of all gists. So there were still some gists whose genetics could not quite be explained. And that explanation, to a certain extent, came in 2003, by which time I'd lost complete interest in what was on in the charts, but if you wanted to know, like our peas. Um, and at this time, I was conveniently finishing a doctorate in cancer genetics, hence my interest uh, in Oxford, back in Oxford again. And again, I should have been concentrating on writing up my doctorate, but I was distracted by the birth of my firstborn, uh, his name's Oliver, and I'm glad to say nine years on, he's matured to be a quiet and sensible child. <laughs> Not, takes after his mother. Uh, um, and uh, interestingly, his birthday is the 4th of October, when the next, uh, um, when it'll be 10, unfortunately. <laughs> or fortunately. Anyway, in 2003, we started filling in that gap. Those gist which don't contain kid mutations, because again, he wrote that, but this time some Americans, again, in science, showed that a proportion of these kit non-mutated gists show mutations in this other protein, this other gene, called platelet-derived growth factor receptor alpha. It's alpha, PDGFRA. And this essentially brings us up to date with what we know about tyrosine kinase, which are what these two proteins are, what we know about tyrosine kinase mutations in gists. So I said different parts of the gene can be mutated, and in the case of KIT, there are four parts, four exons which tend to be mutated. They are exons 11, in particular, exon 9, 13, and 17, on the left-hand side. And with PDGFRA, there are three exons which tend to be mutated in GIST, particularly exon 18, but also exons 12 and 14, rarely. So these are the seven exons that any lab which performs this mutation analysis should be able to look at. And if a I'm going to be a bit controversial here. If a lab says, no, we only offer four or five, well, they should offer seven. Um, <coughs> I'm not quite sure whether I'm allowed to ask this sort of thing, but I'm curious to know. For those of you who've had one removed or know of somebody who has had a gist, can I ask for a show of hands as to whether you know whether it's been genotyped? Is that, is that the same as mutational testing? Correct, sorry, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you know what the mutation analysis is. Of, so, if we presume that everybody here has some sort of link with GIST, that's at most a quarter, yeah, which is interesting. That comes back to something that you said earlier. So, th this pie chart will vary according to which study you look at. But it's roughly similar in the sense that about three quarters of GISTs will harbor KIT mutations, thereabouts, and by far the most in exon 11. And then, after the remaining quarter, about a third or half of those will harbor PDGFRA mutations and mainly in exon 18. And then there are the remaining wild touches, and we will definitely come back to talk about those a bit later on. The reason why these mutations are of diagnostic and clinical and academic interest as well is because certain mutations link with certain clinical appearances of the gist. So, for example, KIT, exon 9 mutations almost always occur in small bowel gists. They are hardly ever found elsewhere, and we don't know why, but that's, that's the way it is. And importantly, from a clinical management point of view, there are some data which show that although exon 9 mutations tend to result in a relative resistance to imatinib, this can be overcome to a certain extent by dose escalation, by doubling the dose. And many of you may or may not have seen this, this survival curve. These are patients with KIT exon 9 mutant gists who've been given 400 milligrams versus 800 milligrams of imatinib and it's been shown that doubling the dose with this particular mutation type is of um, a survival benefit. 
PDGFRA mutations, they are almost always confined to these epithelioid gists. Now, that's the picture I showed you from 1962, Stout's paper, which he called a, limb, a lyomyoblastoma. We would now call that an epithelioid gist. And I'm almost certain that had that gist been studied, that would show a PDGFRA mutation. And we also know that these mutations tend to occur in gists, which occur in the stomach, and more rarely in the omentum. So there's like a link between genetics and what we see under the microscope and what the patient uh, will, will show as well. But the other important thing about PDGFRA mutations, they tend to explain that 5% of gists or so which tend not to show CD117 positivity. Um, and here's an example of a kit mutated gist showing lots and lots of CD117 staining on immunohistochemistry. And this is a truly PDGFRA mutant which shows less staining. And this can be a problem from a histopathologist's point of view because if you are not aware, you might have gone off the diagnosis of gist because you're saying, oh, there's not much CD117 staining there. Okay, um, where does the analysis uh, take place or where, 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 where can you get it done if you want? Uh, I started as soon, pretty much within a year of coming to Bristol. I, I set up the mutation analysis um, here in the histopathology lab at the Bristol Royal Infirmary. Unbeknownst to me, who, a person who is now a good friend and colleague, Dr. Philippe Tenier, who some of you may have uh, heard speaking before, was doing the exact same thing in Birmingham at that time. Um, and since then, four more centres have um, offered the service. Um, the Royal Marsden, um, Cardiff, uh, I have no sympathies for Man City or Man United supporters, but uh, I guess more people know about Man United. Um, and then uh, Dundee, well, there's that jam due to journalism sort of saying, it's difficult to find a, a landmark which uh, exemplifies or sort of describes Dundee. But those are the six centres which perform mutation analysis on a clinical basis. And I know that uh, fairly certain, uh, with great certainty, because I help, well, I, I lead the, there's a, there's a quality assurance scheme for mutation analysis of GISTs, uh, called the UK NEQA scheme, and I'm the lead for that. And labs which offer service should enrol in that service to be tested yearly, whether they're good enough, essentially, to offer the service. And there's only six UK labs which are registered in that scheme at the moment. What do we use to mutation analysis for, for research, research, as we've done? But also, more importantly, for clinical purposes. So three ways we can use mutation analysis. Uh, one is to help diagnose a gist. So here's a true example, something which looks like an epithelial gist maybe, but completely lacks any CD117 staining. You can do mutation analysis, and we've demonstrated PDGFRA mutation. So in this clinical context, this confirms a diagnosis of GIST. So mutation analysis can be very helpful and powerful in that sense. This is more rarely used, but I've included for, for completeness. There are very rare families where your kit or your PDGFRA mutation is passed down from generation to generation. By rare, we're talking about 20 to 30 kit families, and maybe up two or three PDGFRA mutation families, very rare. But, I mean, I've, 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 sorry? In the whole world. In the whole world. Oh, reported yeah. in the literature. Um, I've been asked three times in, what's that, sort of seven years to look for this. In both cases, three cases, it wasn't the case. And what we look for is a mutation, not in the tumour, but in any cell of that patient or that patient's relative's uh, uh, body. And of course, you will know that mutation analysis can play a role in predicting response to tyrosine kinase in inhibitors. So I'm not going to go through this whole table. This is just a, a sort of a, a summary of current data to a certain extent. <coughs> With regards to imatinib, we know that KIT-11 mutant gists tend to respond better to imatinib than, for example, wild-type gists. Certain PDGFRA mutants, particularly this mutant here, um, and that's why Excuse me, it is important to try to get a genotype of any epithelial gist, especially if the patient will go on to get imatinib. And I've talked about exon 9 mutants and dose es escalation. Um, and then there's sunitinib, um, which data suggests tends to respond or tends to work better on exon 9 mutants and wild type gist. These are, these, are, these are not absolutes, these are relatives, I should, I should add at this point. Uh, but you'll notice that the D842 mutant again has been shown, unfortunately, to be 
relatively resistant to sunitinib. Okay, the next step on our journey uh, covers a longer time period. And the reason why it starts in 2004 is because this was the first year a paper described the antibody dog one. Okay, but it wasn't until 2007, 2008 or so that commercial companies started producing um, the antibody. And it's nothing to do with canines, it's named after, uh, discovered on just one. And again, this is immunohistochemistry, uh, and that's what it looks like uh, at the bottom. And the reason why, sorry, and, and after the commercial antibodies released, myself, um, uh, uh, several colleagues in the UK, including Mark Novelli um, at the bottom, and you'll see Philippe's name there as well, um, studied the antibody um, and published about it. And it's, and it's very useful for several reasons. Number one, dog one immunohistochemistry is more specific than CD117 as a marker of GIST. And by specific, I mean this. So let's take GIST. GIST can look similar to lots of other neoplasms. If an antibody only stained GIST and none of the other ones, that would be 100% specific. That would be fantastic, but we know that in medicine, unfortunately, that doesn't exist. There's never 100%. Um, um, if that antibody stains other things which might look like GIST, that antibody is less specific. So dog one is A, more specific than CD117, but it's also currently the most specific immunohistochemical marker of GIST that we know about. So most labs which would look at GIST would almost certainly carry or should carry that antibody or at least use it. In the past, and we're going back five years or so, you may or may not have seen your reports if you've had a GIST resected or seen it. You might have seen these sort of words being used. These are different markers being used to study something which may or may not be a GIST, okay, including CD117. Now, you may have I'm sure you've seen this expression in various guises. Right? If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it most probably it is a duck. Myself and people like Marco now are quite confident with the data that we've accumulated and looking at other people's data to suggest the following. If it looks like a gist and it stains like a gist, and by staining I mean both dog one and CD117, then it is a gist. There's not any other neoplasm that we've come across so far. Which, which does that. And what this does is it simplifies the number of antibodies we need to use, or I would suggest we need to use, when studying a GIST. And I personally, at the moment, in fact, the reason why I was slightly late was I was cutting up a specimen which included a GIST. When those slides come through, if it looks like a GIST, I will order two antibodies, DOG1 and CD117. And if they both are diffusely positive, I, with evidence to back, my, hopefully, my practice, would become conf confident to call it a GIST full stop. But I will also, because I'm interested, and I think it should be done, mutation to analyze that GIST. So there will still be some pathologists, and I'm not saying they're outdated, who will still use a longer panel of antibodies, which is fine, but as long as they include CD117 and DOG1. The third way in which DOG1 has become very helpful from a histopathology diagnostic point of view is with this similar scenario I showed you earlier on. It looks a bit like a GIST, but it's CD117 negative. Now we know that half of those CD117 negative GISTs, half of them will express DOG1. So if it looks like a GIST, but it's CD117 negative, but it's DOG1 positive, I would be happy still to call it a GIST, um, taking the whole clinical context, which you have to do as a pathologist. And so we're to the final chapter of, of this journey at the moment. And this is going to concentrate and is concentrating on these wild type gists, which include almost all pediatric gists, and particularly how they look or how they act from a, at a molecular level. So just to remind you, about 10% uh, of all gists are wild type, and that means they do not show mutations in those seven exons I said should be studied before you call something a wild type gist. You can't call it a wild type gist if you've only studied five, six, three and a half. It's got to be all seven, and all seven must not show mutations and then you can call it a wild type gist. Does anybody know of or has had a wild type gist in this room? I, I knew the answer would be yes. Um, right. Unfortunately, as I said, wild type gists tend to be less responsive to matinine. In adults, 
you can split them up into two main categories. Those which are linked to syndromes, and by syndromes these are medical sort of clusters of, of diseases, such as neurofibromatosis 1 and, and the Carney syndromes. And then you've got those wild type gists which aren't part of the syndrome, so-called non-syndromic gists. And they can take all sorts of um, appearances, spindle cell gists or epithelioid gists. But the interest has come when comparing these adult wild type gists to pediatric gists. Because we know, having studied cohorts of pediatric gists, despite being rare, that most pediatric gists arise in the stomach. Most of them have this epithelioid sort of appearance. And if you look at certain groups of these adult wild type gists, particularly the carny ones, and these non-syndromic gists, well, the clinical features almost overlap. So they tend to occur in the stomach, they tend to be epithelioid, round cell. Interestingly, they tend to spread to lymph nodes, which is very unusual for mutated gists. So that picture I showed you from Stout's paper back in 1962, when he described a lymph node metastatic gist, I'm almost certain that would have been a wild type gist. And unfortunately, as I said, wild type gists, adult children, tend to respond less well to matinee. In fact, recently it has been recognized that there is a so-called pediatric variant of adult gists, which is what I've been talking about. And the reason why I'm banging on about this is because from a diagnostic point of view, there may be some use in knowing this. We now know that these wild type gists tend to show certain molecular signatures. First of all, a lot of them show loss of a protein called, it's quite a long name, succinate dehydrogenase B, SDHB on the top. Some of these gists, these wild type gists, express a protein called insulin growth factor receptor 1, IGFR1, and we have both antibodies in our lab. Um, and a proportion, not all of them, about 10-15% of wild type gists will carry a mutation in a gene called BRAF, right at the bottom. And the reason why these may be important is because I look at sequencing myself, and it's easy to read a sequence when it's very clean and there's no um, um, distortion to the sequence. But sometimes when you've got tissue which has been harvested a long time ago or the technique has not worked so well, it can be quite time consuming. So don't let anybody who's not actually done sequencing tell you that sequencing is easy and it's not black and white. There's still, I was going to say 50 shades of grey, um, there's still shades of grey. It, it can be subjective. Um, it's never black and white. And for me, as a diagnostician, to have an immunohistochemical marker, which A, is quicker and cheaper, would be a great bonus. So, at the current time, as I speak, we're, we're looking to see whether there may be some markers which might be able to actually predict all type of genotype. And secondly, of course, there are molecules or drugs constantly being produced, constantly being produced which target specific antibodies. So, there's a drug which targets BRAF, that particular mutation which is currently being licensed for melanoma use and there are, at an experimental level, IGFR1 targeted therapies so perhaps in the future these might be targets used for wild type gists perhaps. So I'm going to stop my talk, obviously this isn't the end of the journey. Um, to conclude, I hope I've presented to you the fact that when we are diagnosing a gist from a laboratory point of view we rely heavily on light microscopy as well as immunohistochemistry, but we can often use mutation analysis to help us. Of course, mutation analysis can help guide treatment as well. And I'm quite certain the journey will certainly continue with regards to wild type gist. And while me myself is often distracted by things, I will certainly be keeping very focused on what happens, particularly with wild type gists, and trying myself to contribute to that uh, story and journey as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.